All right. Well, it says we are live on the top left corner. So hello, everybody. Welcome to Realm of the Elderlings Reflections. I'm really excited to have a great panel in front of me today. If you are new to my channel, my name is Josh and you are watching this on Red Fury Books. And my channel, I basically talk about a lot of different kinds of books. But I've been talking a lot about fantasy in the last couple of years because I took a big break from reading fantasy. About 15 years, maybe even 20 years, I didn't read a lot of fantasy. I read a lot of other things, classics and Russian literature and nonfiction and crime fiction and a lot of, a lot of different things. So I've gotten back into reading fantasy and it's exciting because I've missed out on a lot of great series, but a lot of them are done. So in the past three years or so, I've read all of the Wheel of Time. I've read all of the first law books, read all of the Realm of the Elderlings. And it's just been really exciting to me to be reading this genre and just loving it so much. So we're going to talk about Realm of the Elderlings and Robin Hobb today. And I have a great panel in front of me today that's going to help me talk about this series. As I was nearing the end of my journey, journey through Realm of the Elderlings, the first thing I thought was, well, I'll give a review. And then I thought about, I said, no, I want to talk with others about it because I sometimes feel that discussions can get kind of more deeper understanding and deeper meaning than just one person talking about, you know, their impressions of the themes and so forth. So I was very happy that the first four people that were on top of my list that I know love this series like I do, were all available to be able to schedule this live stream. So as I introduce them, I'm going to have them just talk, talk about their experience with the series, where they started, how long it took them to read it, if they've read it more than once, if they're doing a reread now, that sort of thing. If you're not familiar with the series, there are five interconnected series. So it's 16 books, but it's not just one book series. There are five separate series, four trilogies and one quartet or tetralogy, however you want to call it. And they all interconnect, but there's actually kind of two different places you can start. And some people don't read all five series. There's a lot of options out there. So we're going to talk about that as I introduce them. As for me, I read Realm of the Elderlings over a span of about 15 months. And I read them in publication order, which means I started with the Farseer trilogy, Live Ship Traders, Honey Man, Rain Wild, and finished up with Fits in the Fool. And I read each series by itself and then took a couple months off to read other th things and then came back to the next series and experienced it like that. So uh, let's just go ahead. I'm going to introduce, let's start, uh, Matt, let me introduce you next so I can give you also congratulations. I think this week your channel just hit 5,000 subscribers. So congratulations to you and tell us about your channel and your initial experience with, with Realm of the Elderlings. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Yeah, I'm uh, Matt from Matt's Fantasy Book Reviews. I've got a uh, channel that's I, I've been doing videos for about seven or eight months now, and it took me probably about a year, almost exactly a year, to read this series. I read one every few weeks, um, no breaks in between, but I read a lot of different series at once, and so it just kind of fell into that cycle that I read them every few weeks or so. Um, and I just fell in love with the series even after the first book. Um, it, it was so different. It was uh, this deep character dive that I don't get to experience very often in fantasy. I mean, fantasy typically for me is a, a, a genre that really emphasizes the world building and the magic. And oftentimes you get these characters and the deep dive into characters, it's kind of a backseat. And so to see that be very flipped and have, you know, magic be implemented, but not the forefront of the series and to really just be a masterclass in character writing just immediately appealed to me. Um, and really my experience, uh, although it, it had a small dip at, at a certain point um, that I'm sure it dipped for most people that read this series, um, consistently I was thrilled by this series and it, it ultimately ranks as one of my top, I don't know, three or four favorite series I've ever read. So in, in love with it. Awesome. Uh, Scott, let's go to you next. Uh, yeah, thanks. I uh, appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. So I'm uh, Scott. I'm the bald booktuber. I've been doing uh, YouTube stuff since January, uh, just kind of out of the blue. I, I was a big YouTube consumer and decided to produce some at the same time. So that's been fun. Uh, I first read Farseer and Live Ship back in the early 2000s uh, and loved them back then. Uh, I got interested because they were recommended by Mr. George R.R. R. Martin, who was my TBR picker at the time. So he introduced me to Hobb and to Abercrombie and to Scott Lynch. Uh, the dude just uh, never missed. Jim Butcher. 
So most of my favorite fantasy stuff, uh, I, I have George to thank. So I appreciate that. Um, and so I started a reread of those two and then did the rest of it last year. So over the course of January through December, I did the 16 books, uh, ultimately with Assassin's Fate being my book of the year and the best book I've read in the last 20 years. Uh, easily the best book I've read since Storm of Swords uh, back in the early 2000s. So um, I, I think that's absolutely a perfect book. So uh, she is my favorite writer. I can't uh, wait to tell everybody how wonderful everything she does is. Um, and uh, the we were talking a little bit before the show, but uh, three of my favorite trilogies are part of this entire series. So we've got Fitz and the Fool, and then Tawny Man, and then Live Ship. I put them in that order, but I, I don't argue when people put them in a different order, but those are three of my very favorite trilogies ever. And the fact that she penned all of them and made them all part of the same world, I think is amazing. Uh, has two of my top five characters in all of fantasy with Fitz and the Fool. Has my very favorite animal companion in all of fantasy uh, with Night Eyes. So uh, second favorite uh, overall story of all time besides uh, Song of Ice and Fire. So. Uh, as you can tell, I'm I'm a bit of a fanboy when it comes to Miss Queen Robin Hobb. <laughs> I love it, Scott. <laughs> yeah, when you told me that it was the best book you read in 20 years, that made me take notice immediately. So, all right, uh, Jimmy, how about you? Hey, uh, I'm Jimmy from the Fantasy Network, and I read Realm of the Elderlings in its entirety last year. And Assassin's Fate was my book of the year last year as well. Um, it. Yeah, I mean, I just thought it the uh, the task at hand to end a 16 book series that had a lot of emotions writing on it is a uh, tall ticket for anyone to punch. And Robin Hobb did it uh, in spades, at least for me and my subjective experience. But yeah, Realm of the Eldings is amazing. And I also, just like Scott, uh, got the recommendation from Mr. George R. R. Martin himself. I started my entire booktube channel chasing the next A Song of Ice and Fire type read because it, you know, reintroduced me to fantasy and reading. And it means a lot to me. And Run of the Elderlings is always on the top of those lists when it comes to things that are like it. And yeah, in some ways it is, mm -hmm. but it also stands by itself very much as its own uh, amazingly epic in a, in a different way, in a personal way, uh, series and is now definitely in among my top five, probably top three, possibly even favorite series of all time. So uh, I'm happy to be here. I love talking more Run of the Elderlings. And that was the only sad thing about Assassin's Fate being over is that they were done. And, uh, and that I, uh, you know, moved on to other stuff, but it's always something that's in the back of my mind. And I think about the series quite often. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I feel having just finished the series, uh, nine days ago, I'm the newest one here. I feel like I have my bachelor's in Hob now, but a <laughs> resident PhD with probably extra doctoral work as well as dairy. <laughs> Jerry, tell us about your experience with Ms. Hobb, Queen Hobb, as we say, and Real the Realm of the Elderlings. Um, a bit like Scott, I started reading in the early 2000s. Um, basically, the cover sort of winked at me from the shelf. I, had, I bought the original John Howe, beautifully painted covers, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think it just looks really interesting. And... It wasn't what I expected when I read Assassin's Apprentice. It, I, I thought it was going to be something completely different, but it was what it was. And I pretty much inhaled all of the books that were out at the time and reread them every time a new book came out. And then in 2011, I had a stroke, which was new material really difficult. So I was glad that I had holding under my belt so I could keep adding to it. And it became the absolute part of my reading. Because I just don't stop reading it. I, look, I read Assassin's Fate. I cry for a while. And then I pick up Assassin's Apprentice again and start again. Because there's always something to find. And I still find new things. And I still cry. And I still laugh. And I still think that the main can be an idiot. And <laughs> still holds up. And for me, the most magical thing a book can do is to give you that experience every time. Fantastic. I'll tell you, I felt the same way when I started I've reading. Read <laughs> yeah. When I started reading, when I finished Assassin's Fate last week, I immediately, my first thought was, how can I read anything else after this? Mm -hmm. 
I found it such a moving experience, such an emotional experience. And I thought, have I, have I peaked? You know, is this the peak of literature for me? <laughs> so I certainly understand going right into Assassin's Apprentice because I can't wait to read it and read it again and to experience it from the lens of knowing the full story, but seeing all the details and knowing that Hobb had a plan and how all of the things that we talk about in Assassin's Quest that maybe might not have worked that first time, we see the end of the tale and understand, you know, why it was there. So I'm, I'm really excited for that reread. Um, I don't know when that'll happen for me, but it's, it's definitely a guarantee. So uh, Scott, you're rereading mm -hmm. it right now, correct? Yeah, I'm in the middle of it. I started uh, Assassin's Apprentice earlier this month, and then I just flew through that, flew through Royal Assassin. I'm probably, I don't know, I'm probably 200 pages away from Assassin's Quest being in the books too, um, but I'm trying to kind of roll through this and prepare myself for some more collaborations I'll be doing uh, on Mike's channel with Realm of the Elderlings. So, um, I as I was reading Assassin's Fate, the one thing that stuck out to me and the one thing I tell people is that it makes every book before it even better somehow. And the book I think that benefits the most is Assassin's Quest. I think it just makes that book just sensationally better. And it's a book I already like. So um, it's crazy. Great. One thing both Scott and Jimmy talked about was, well, and Derry alluded to it as well, their first experience with the book, you know, why they decided to read it. Uh, let me go over to you, Matt. Why did you, you know, what made you initially pick up the first book of Farseer? I was um, getting back into fantasy. I had the same journey, I think, than the multi, multiple of you had where I was a big, enormous A Song of Ice and Fire fan mm -hmm. and kind of thought that was the pinnacle of fantasy without having really read any other fantasy. I just declared that Nothing could be better than this. And I read it multiple times and then kind of took a break from fantasy. But at one point I thought, you know, I need to get back into fantasy again and try this out. And so I essentially went through, um, there's a, every year or two Reddit fantasy does a thread on the best fantasy series. And so I just kind of started grinding down that list and without knowing anything about the books uh, themselves, just trusting the masses on, on their opinions, which for me generally are line up with my taste as well. So that one just winded up on the list. I knew nothing about it as I went into it um, other than seeing the book cover and it just blew me away. Yeah. So it wasn't fantasy as it ought to be written. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do love that. And I, I'm the same way. I do take, I do take. That's not wrong. It's not wrong. And that's the thing. It is, it is not wrong. Uh, <laughs> I'm the same way, though. I do take recommendations from authors. I've read a lot of things simply because Stephen King has recommended them. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly word of mouth was one thing for me. And then as I was playing catch up, I was kind of doing the same thing as Matt, just kind of Googling like best fantasy series and all of those sorts of things. And it just seemed natural for me to pick it up next. So let's let's talk next about what is it what do you find so compelling about this book series and what made it so great for you? Because I think that is, those are some of the things that will draw potential new readers to this series. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in, but what I, I think the biggest thing for me that this series does, and I alluded to it was the character work, but more specifically, and the thing that I've never been able to experience, and I don't know if anything else really does it to the level that this does, but it's, the character growth, um, specifically around Fitz. Um, now, the Fitz stories aren't even my favorite. Um, you know, Live Ship is my favorite. But watching the growth of Fitz go from a little boy to an older man and being able to experience his life along with him is a very magical experience that it's, it's very special because the attachment that I uh, made with this character is one that I've never been able to experience before. It's very deep. And by the end of that story, you know, I found myself kind of in a lull on, you know, I, I don't want to be gone from this character. He felt, you know, a part of my life. And it, I, I'm very sad that I don't get to continue going through uh, this character's life anymore. And, it, it, you know, normally when I finish a fantasy series, I am very 
happy. And while I, I was very happy that I finished and I thought the conclusion was stunning, um, I was left in a very almost sad place in, in a good way that this author made me go through these emotions and really having high emotions, either high or low, are not something that always happens, even on books that I love. Uh, but this is one of the few that really made me very emotional and, you know, really searching deep in my soul about, you know, what was it about the series that made me uh, feel all these different feelings that I just don't get to experience before. And it's, I hope that I find another series someday that can evoke the same amount out of out of me, but I, I've never read one that has done it. And I, I desperately hope that there's more out there. Yeah, I think um, for me, there's a few things at play. So um, I'm a character first reader. It's got my favorite characters in the genre. So that helps a lot. Uh, Fitz and the Fool, I think I could read them doing anything. Uh, but their interactions together, I think, is the best character relationship I've ever read in any story, uh, which is important. I'm a huge dragon fan. I love dragons. And there's plenty of cool dragons in the series, which is awesome. Uh, I love the two magic systems that are fleshed out slowly over the series. I think the skill is one of the cooler things uh, that I've ever seen imparted, and you learn more and more about it. And then the wit, anytime there is animal companionship and this kind of thing, I'm, I'm big into that as well. So uh, there isn't anything about this series that doesn't speak to me specifically. So if any of those things are, are things that you you, the person that haven't read this yet, uh, think would be cool. Uh, you definitely owe it to yourself to check it out. For sure. So, yeah. Derry, you said something to me when we were on one of the discords. Because um, the, the end of Assassin's Fate kind of wrecks you a little bit. And I was kind of wrecked for a little bit. Uh, the first time I probably in my life have experienced the book hangover, as they call it, um, because it was so emotional and so strong. And then, Derry, you said you just reread so that you don't have to end the journey with Fitz. Yeah. It is. I mean, is that your, is that um, your the whole biggest reason or? Um, it's part of it. But I think, no, the reason that I can is the sheer depth of the story the first reread you do and you find this at the moment reading a whole nother story because now that you've followed you've chased the initial story to its conclusion now you can see what else was there and that first reread is like reading an entire new series so mm. you're getting two immensely long incredibly well written series for the price of one and <laughs> To be able to explore all those layers every time and to see chapter woven it is continues to amaze me because a lot of people get to the end and go, oh, I'm in the realm of the elderlings. Because there's been a story being told about the elders all through, but they never made things seemingly more at the forefront. And there's a dexterity and a depth to that that I appreciate just anything. It's just a... Scott, are you experiencing that in your, because this is your first read, reread? Is that, or yeah. you, yeah. Um, some stuff that has always hit me is hitting me even harder now, uh, with especially Fitz as a young man in Assassin's Apprentice. Um, because theoretically, this is my third read. I mean, not theoretically, it's my third read. But the first one was so long ago that it feels like an entirely different thing. But uh, just rereading it, picking up from what I know from Assassin's Fate. Yeah, there's there's a ton of extra depth there, as Derry's talking about. Um, and I'm super, super enjoying it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's going really well. It has a ser It's a series with a ton of rereadability, is what I would say. Um, which most of my favorite series fall under that category, I think. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, <clears throat> I imagine would make a reread really valuable, which I have not read reread re the series yet, is, uh, uh, you know, Fitz as a character, like we can talk about character development and stuff, but the way that that uh, comes across and the way that you can achieve that as a writer is being able to have a strong command over your perspective. Mm -hmm. And Steven Erickson says that whenever he does workshops and he's done them in the past is he actually reads 
uh, from Assassin's Apprentice a lot of the times because he thinks that it is one of the best examples ever of perspective. And we're not just talking about like, what is it first person or third person? It, it, it goes a lot deeper than that. And you can see it in little things of the way Fitz uh, inner monologues with himself or the way that he sees some pieces of the world. He thinks that Birch is a very old man. Birch is so old. And he's like 24, he's like 24, 25. Right? You know, I think. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, dude, he's not that old, but like, you don't, I didn't even realize that till like books and books later. And then, you know, you start to think back and you're like, well, what else from Fitz's perspective is not totally, um, you know, correct, I should say, or, or what a different lens that maybe we would see it in if we had like a third person omniscient kind of narrator. Right. So the fact that Fitz is the narrator for at least the Fitz books uh, plays with us, plays with us a lot. And I think going back to it with the experience of having have the whole series and all the context with it is I could probably pick out a couple more things that Fitz was wrong about. So I imagine that that's probably really, really rewarding on a reread. And um, it also adds a personal attachment uh, to a character on a different type of level than most people can provide. Um, I think a lot of times in third person limited perspective, you know, you can get really close to a character. One of the reasons why I like a song of ice and fire so much is that the characters, uh, you know, you're over the shoulder, they're unreliable at times. And that's really fun. But when you take it in the first person and you have someone who has the writing style of Hob, uh, that that's something different. Uh, that, that's, that's a different type of accomplishment and a different type of task that uh, she does very, very well. Yeah, very well said. Um, let's go next to something you started to allude to is really Hobbes prose. I've, I've mm -hmm. always said that I, I don't notice prose unless it's really good or it's really bad. <laughs> and I think that's, probably still true to a certain extent, but I know the more that I read, the more I appreciate someone with a great command of the English language, mm -hmm. um, which Hobb does so well. Do any of you want to touch upon that maybe a little bit more eloquently than I just did? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I'll continue uh, since I kind of already started it down this path a little bit um, and I'll keep it brief. But, you know, with uh, prose, a lot of times what we're talking about is style, right? We're talking about the style of writing and, with Robin Hobb, the thing that I see a lot of times, people say, oh, I heard her prose was amazing, but like, you know, it's not that purple, it's not flowery, but prose extends far beyond uh, adjectives and, and descriptions. It, it goes into exactly how you break up your dialogue. It goes into how you pace your even your paragraphs and where you decide to throw a period or a comma or whatever. And one of the things that Hobb has done extraordinarily well, at least in all the books I've read in Realm of the Elderlings, is the fact that she is able to segue between exposition and dialogue so very well. And I would say that her biggest strengths actually come from her dialogue because she says things in moments and doesn't say things in moments with characters that I feel comes out very, very naturally and um, withholding of information and, and these type of things. Um, but she knows when to reach into her bag and, and put, put a little flair on it she, she she doesn't overuse it and it never becomes tiresome to read i think she's an extremely readable author and uh, she can be very pointed but she can also be very long-winded in a good way uh in with her descriptions and sometimes she just pieces together a perfect sentence it doesn't have any 50 dollars words in it but she pieces together these words that we use every single day and she forms them in a way that speaks to you uh, on a much deeper level than just exposition so i think that that is the kind of the magic of of her of her um, craft. Yeah, I, I, she's the most beautiful writer, in my opinion, that I've ever read. I think one thing I really like is that she easily conveys emotion through her words. Um, I know when one character is annoyed with another character uh, <laughs> very easily without her having to stamp it out uh, yeah. and, and be, you know, it's, it's subtle, but it's easy to understand. I know when a character feels sympathy or loss or something else for another character, like, uh, those things definitely speak to me as well as like the inscriptions at the beginning of many chapters. I like historically she's laying things out for us and showing us what has happened before and why it's going to be critical later. And all that stuff I think flows just like water. It just, mm -hmm. I don't know what she does. I'm not a writer. Uh, never will be probably, but uh, whatever it is, uh, it makes it to where reading her is, is my favorite thing to read that her stuff is the best in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with with both of what you said. The uh, it's just one of those experiences where, like you said, Jimmy, it can feel the pacing might be slow, but it doesn't feel slow. Mm -hmm. And just her balance between 
I guess what's important and with her pacing and plotting is, is just so great. Um, I, I always hate when people say that her books are slow because some of those slower moments are some of my favorite moments in the entire <laughs> series. Uh, for okay. instance, not a spoiler, but the Tawny Man trilogy, which is the third series of the realm of the elderlings, the first 200 pages of book one, the plot goes absolutely nowhere. And it may be 200 of my most favorite pages in the entire mm -hmm. realm of the elderlings. Yeah. 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 Josh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I wanted yeah. to kind of touch on that and, because uh, yeah. she, I, I do think she does write very slow. I happen to like that. Um, but when I, whenever I've talked about this book and I've had people come in and say that they don't, they can't appreciate this series. The thing that I always hear from them is that they don't like the pacing. They don't like how slow it is and they can't appreciate it for what it is because I don't think that there's any series out there for everybody. Sure. Um, but this one does appeal to those that really do want a slower pace that want a character study and character growth. And, but I don't think you need, you should go into the series expecting, you know, this lightning fast, fast pace or even a medium pace. You shouldn't go in expecting these huge set pieces, um, these things that you would expect out of um, fantasy books that have been written in the past, you know, 30 years, things that show up in almost every other fantasy series. Um, and, and like you, Josh, you know, I've, I, I've said the same thing. Oh, hey, Eli. Uh, this is my thought, everybody. <laughs> um, but I, I've long said that I could read an entire book like that first 200 pages in, in Tawny Man, and, and I would be very happy. She could write about anything, and I'd be happy because I, I don't need that plot to go anywhere because of how good she is as a writer. Mm -hmm. Fool's Aaron's so yeah. good. It really is. It's yeah. my favorite of all of them um, and has been for a long time, and mostly because of those first 200 pages because we actually mm -hmm. just get to spend time with our character not being impelled to behave a certain way or being driven by events. He's just there and interacting with whoever's around him. And I find that to be one of the most attractive periods of time in the whole saga. And because, as everyone has said, her character work has very much become byword, but she does it in such a way that all of her characters interact with all of her other characters in a very um individual way everyone has their own relationships with everybody else and all of them speak to each other in that way and all of characters um evolve all of her characters grow all of them adapt all of them change and all of them still maintain that individual relationship with the people around them at the stage that they are which is a skill in character writing i don't think a lot of authors and Hob is able to give its books, which are that first person perspective, able to give you these beautiful, well rounded characters, not just the ones immediately around Fitz, but the secondary characters, tertiary characters, to the extras that wander on occasionally the side of the page. All of them feel real. And, mm, it, it's Wonderful to read. Just wonderful. I marveled in the Fitz books. One of the first things that drew me to the books in the Farseer trilogy was seeing the characters through Fitz's eyes. And they felt so real. And without the benefit of point of view, which is, I guess, the more modern way, modern approach to writing nowadays, you, you get a lot of point of view. And when you have a point of view, of course, you really know a character. But I felt like I knew all of these characters so well. Mm -hmm. Granted, it was through the lens of Fitz, but it, I still felt just it was so masterfully done. And I was just so impressed with that. And that was something that for me, I connected immediately with her writing because of the skill that she showed in character from that perspective in Farseer. Yeah, I feel like she shows character flaws better than anyone I've seen. And often the flaws are things that I appreciate more about the character. If that makes any sense, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but uh, it's more than just 
these are the great things about this person. These are also the things that hold them back and are, are limiting to their character. And I find that fascinating. I don't know what it is, but again, she does it better than anyone I've seen. I mean, Scott, for me, it's, it's because it's real. It's real life. Um, yeah. you, know, you read so much fantasy where, it, in, in books that I enjoy, by the way, I'm not criticizing other fantasy. Yeah. These people feel flawless, or at least their flaws are very minimal, or their whole character revolves around that one specific flaw. Uh, mm -hmm. But these characters here that have these flaws, they feel like people that I know. They feel like me, um, sure. you know, these complicated people that are not perfect. Um, and it's it's great. Yep. Agree. Yeah, I felt especially reading mm -hmm. parts of Fitz and the Fool recently. You know, Fitz is easily my favorite literary character. And, and, you know, second place is of whoever that is. It's a it's a you know, they won the race you know, going away as they say in the horse racing or whatever. Um, <laughs> but I felt that with Fitz, just watching him yeah. make bad decisions and do things that you don't like, but you still connect with him. Cause again, at like, just like Matt said, he just feels real and he feels human. And you just, I just felt so much empathy for him at so many times in this series even when he was doing the wrong things and you just want to yell at him, <laughs> don't do that. Mm -hmm. Don't make that decision. <laughs> but it, it just, it just felt so real. Definitely. It's like your friends, you know, you watch them head toward disaster and you're like, no, do that. But you still <laughs> love them because they're part of your life and you care about them. But they like, it's a real person. Fitz is a real person. And, one thing Hobb does too that um, we often see other authors not always succeed with is something major will happen to her characters and that will continue to be part of their character from that point on. All yes. of the events characters go through alter the way they behave from there on and it alters the way they think, it changes the way they react. So when we talk about character driven that that can often and feel very, you know, Deus ex machina. Whereas in this instance, it is the case because they're flawed, because they're traumatized, because there's flaws and trauma, that's what leads the story. And that's what they're making, which leads us down this path. That's just, I don't have enough words to describe how incredibly talented I think that that is. Yeah, one of the ideas that she plays with, I think that it speaks to like, you know, we're, we're saying realist, realistic and we're, we're talking about realism. But uh, one of the ideas that Hobbes plays with with her characterization is the fact that we're all someone different to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, so you guys know me, you know, Jimmy Nuts, mm -hmm. you know, you see me and we have a relationship and we talk. But to uh, the people at my gym, I'm a totally different person uh, sure. to the people I met at, you know, the Dunkin Donuts drive through today. I was a different person. <laughs> And uh, it, it's really interesting because you're not always the hero um, to everybody. Uh, you, might, you might be the world's biggest a-hole to somebody else, right? And I think Hobb plays with this idea quite a bit, uh, not just with Fitz, but um, in, in the characters around Fitz. And also plays with it quite a bit in live ships, where you get to see her go into that third-person perspective, which I also think that she does a really nice job of. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt, I don't, someone probably knows other than me. I don't know when Live Ship was written, but it seemed like it might have been before the morally gray or morally ambiguous characters seemed to be big. But that seems like that's what she wrote so well in that series because there were a couple truly reprehensible characters that <laughs> you still, there were aspects of them that you liked. And then some of the characters that you liked still had aspects aspects that you did you know didn't like a lot of their decisions and things like that and it seems like that was i don't know maybe it was just early in my journey of more modern fantasy that i read it but it seemed to be earlier than you know that seems to be the norm nowadays it looks like it was published in 1998 which means she probably wrote it in the early 90s so this is right around the same time as like you know game of thrones and stuff and obviously there was some morally gray characters before this, but it wasn't like a trend, I would say, in the genre just yet. So I think that Kennet is like a landmark in the genre. Yeah. For sure. villain ever. 
slash antagonist yep. slash whatever you want to call it's him. Out, it's outstanding. Mm. Yeah. yeah he, he's, or he's just or outstanding. Kyle. I mean, readers who are used to, well, mm, Kyle, <laughs> <laughs> I, we after over 20 reads of live ships, I cannot stand that character. He I hate him so much <laughs> every time. And again, that's that visceral reaction that she can get out of you 20 times later is astonishing. I, I never sort of go, oh, here we go again. No, every time I'm still thinking, oh, I hate you, stop it. No, it's, and then we get the nuance in Kenneth, who just so incredibly skillfully written that mm -hmm. not only is he fascinating as you read him the more you learn about the, the way that his character was formed and all of the things that he went through and you're still getting information that informs your understanding of his character in the final series and he just becomes even more, more fascinating we know and yet he is possibly the most evil person I've read and also the person who I think would have left the biggest legacy in terms of their impact on the world around them and oh, just it's unreal quality of this writer it's just oh. I'll tell you that was one of the things that I guess surprised me most in the fits in the full trilogy was how much of live ship influenced that series and how much that came back in terms of character and what happened in that series. And it was so, I read them about a year apart and it was just so exciting just to experience these characters again. And as you said, we got more information on them in that series as well. Mm -hmm. It really all did tie together because up to that point, I mean, live ship influenced rain wild chronicles for sure, but I think even more fits in the full and that's, one of the reasons I have such admiration for that final trilogy is how just skillfully she was able to weave together everything. You know, it was the end of Fitz's journey, but she weaved in every single one of the series in such a, such a masterful way. Yeah. Yeah. Josh, I do think that reading the series, there's a level of trust you have to put into the author because of the choices that she made mm -hmm. in splitting this story up. Mm -hmm. You know, it does that, Malazan thing where you get a book that feels disconnected from the main series and the characters that you've come to know and love. And it feels very off-putting when you first start up with live ship and you say like, where is this author going with this? <laughs> the characters are not the same. And was this just a side project that's not going to tie in? And, and it, to, to a same degree with, uh, with Rainwild. And I, I, I think you need to trust the author that there is a point to this. And it's not just to tie things in and make things all nice and tidy. It makes the story better. And it makes the story actually make sense uh, by the end of this for how it, it, it ends up weaving everything together. For sure. I guess I've, I've seen people talk about, I haven't read Malazan yet. That's happening next year, of course. But um, I hear people talk about Malazan and talk about convergence as a thematic element of that and i feel there was a lot of that in this series as well mm -hmm. for sure i mean starting as early as tawny man right because it really oh, yeah. wove mm -hmm. it together farseer and what she was doing in live ship so yeah it's definitely something she did very skillfully throughout the series i thought i think when we were talking about the pacing the thing of the... that a lot of uh, readers new to the series oh, sorry is um there's a thunderstorm. That's why I'm out of sync. <laughs> and hopefully, I'm the, uh, the uh, Farsia Live Ships and Tawny Man were initially the complete story. The mm -hmm. end of Tawny Man was the end of Realm of the Elderlings. And after that, she wrote the Soldier Sun trilogy to relatively poor uh, effect. And sadly, I'm a part of that. It wasn't fits in the fall. It's not what I wanted. And right. um, eventually she came back and wrote the next arc of the story with uh, the Rainwild Chronicles and fits in the fall, which was literally a, a, an added arc. That, that arc 
could then be into it with what already existed and enrich it the way that it did mm -hmm. is another lesson in this is how you do it. And yep. for it to work so beautifully as a whole is simply marvelous, really. That, that's mind blowing to me. I didn't know that uh, before you just mentioned that, Darian. That doesn't seem possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, that's, I know, right? It's incredibly impressive on her part. Derry and I are going to try Soldier Sun again next year. Neither one of us was impressed the first time around. So uh, we'll see how it goes next year. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you think of the end of Tawny Man, and it does have a very final. I mean, that la I, <laughs> the last line just sticks with me. And, you yeah. know, tears and all of that. It's just, it's so well done. And you see it, but when I started Rain Wild, the thing that struck me right away is how much world building was going on in that series. Oh, because yeah. even at the end of Tawny Man, I didn't really feel I knew exactly what an elderling was. I didn't understand how it all fit together. And that's why I feel the last two series are so important because it does give you the whole big perspective of, of everything from a world standpoint. Yeah, I agree. I didn't particularly love either of the first two Rain Wild books. I love them because they're hot, but I didn't love them <laughs> just on the base. But I really do love those last two books in Rain Wilds. I thought they were both excellent. And then we go into Fits of the Fool, which I think is just a masterpiece from cover to cover. And I don't know how it can be improved upon. So, so what's everybody's favorite trilogy or well maybe yeah, Rain Wild? What, what's your favorite? What's your favorite of the five everybody hmm I mean, live ship for me is an easy easily uh, I, I love them all but live ship is uh a step above for me uh, especially that last book um you know it's i'm doing a series right now where i'm counting down my top 100 favorite books and um you know one of the one of those books is a like the number two of all time for me. I, I, I just think it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, it fits in the fool for me. Um, although it's not far above either Tawny Man or Live Ship. Like it's they're they're all three so so close. And and Farseer I love as well. So it it isn't as if it started off poorly for me. So uh, really the whole thing is just incredible. But yeah, Fits in the Fool is my favorite. Uh, yeah, sub series. I think well, my heart says fits in the full, um, but from like just a story element, I think it's probably my favorite is fits in the full. But I think live ship might be the most impressive, even though it probably ranked second to last for me or third. Uh, I don't know. It's not my. It probably wouldn't be in my top two. But um, the thing about live ship is, is that it's like a contained story, and yes, it has like implications to other things in Realm of the Elderlings. But like if you just take that for what it is. It is incredibly done. Like I, I just I love that series. I love the character development over three books is really incredible. Um, the thing about Fits in the Fool, and this is why it's so hard to compare, is like Fits in the Fool cashes in on a lot of stuff that was set up mm -hmm. all the way back in Farseer. Right. So like without Farseer, Fits in the Fool isn't Fits in the Fool. So that's why like I can see. I would almost say that Live Ship is like almost the most impressive. Um, but my personal favorite is definitely Fits in the Fool because it, it is like you know. It's the climax of, of 16 books. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah. We can all agree that Rain Wild is yeah. on the bottom of our list. What's your favorite, Josh? For me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, my favorite, <laughs> I think it would be, I think it would be Fits in the Fool for me. Okay. Kind of a coin flip, maybe a three-sided coin with Live yeah. Shift and uh, Tawny yeah. Man, because I love Tawny Man. Tawny yeah. Man is incredible. Um before mm -hmm. we went on, we were talking a little bit. And I mean, those three are all S tier trilogies for me. Mm -hmm. And I love all three of them. I would probably say fits in the full just because that ending just hits so hard. Yeah. I mean, I finished the, so it's not a spoiler, but the last chapter is three pages, but the penultimate chapter yeah. is a lot happens and it's very heavy. <laughs> and I got to the last chapter and it was three pages and it took me 30 minutes to read it. Because mm -hmm. I just couldn't concentrate on the words. I was just trying to process everything that happened. And, and it, di it did. And that's not an exaggeration. It literally took me 30 minutes to read three pages because of what had happened before it. Uh, so for me, I think Fits in the Fool is mm -hmm. my number 
one. But, uh, you know, if someone says live ships, their favorite by all means, or Tawny man, <laughs> mm-hmm. let me ask, let me ask this though, because a lot of us do yep. prefer live ship over Farseer. Would you ever recommend somebody to read live ship first? Because you probably could. So, uh, I'm the publication order always guys. So I'll talk. Um, the only person I would say that should read live ship first is if they have no interest whatsoever in the fifth story. So if they're only going to read live ship, I would rather have them only mm-hmm. read that. you read no hob at all, but, um, the connections and stuff can be made backwards, but I think a lot is missing that way. Um, reading Farseer first and then live ship just hits a certain way as we all know. Um, and it's my probably favorite reveal in all of fiction. So I really want people to read it what I would consider the right way. So there you go. Any dissenting opinions? <laughs> I'm with you, Scott. <laughs> no, I think it's better to read that way. I think you absolutely <laughs> could read it the other way. Um, you know, and I have recommended people read live ship if they just don't like, um, the, the, the first book, because yeah. I think you're missing out on something that's a very different read. Um, and it's I think perfect. there's a lot of people that may really like live ship that just don't like that fits arc. Um, and that's, and, and I wouldn't want them to miss out and think that, you know, all of this huge series is the same thing. Because it's very different and you can get, I think there are people that may like one over the other um, or really dislike one over the other and, but they're missing out if they don't just do it. Yeah. There's also like, if people really dislike first Absolutely. person. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Derry. I, I have, um, I was going to say that, that I will always recommend live ships as a standalone series. If the mass, is too daunting or Matt said if it just doesn't appeal read live ships because it is phenomenal and can stand on its own but as an entry point try Farseer first because it is important that you get that information in that order because if you read live ships first it undermines complete any of the threads that you're getting in Farseer and so you lose the connection to those characters because you know that doing isn't as world important as it's supposed to be and that diminishes in my mind your connect to the story. I know that Chris the Bookish Cauldron began with live ships and mm-hmm. retrospectively went back and read Fitz. Yes Realm of the Elderlings is his fa- one of his favorites, but even he admits that yes, it detracted from his enjoyment reading mm-hmm. it that way around. And yep. I'm all for people loving it as much as I do. So I want them to get best experience. So to please try Farsia first. So yeah, but Life Ship is phenomenal, but it is just oh, exceptional. <laughs> Daria, on this overall point, I have a question for you and that, you know, we're all talking about our favorite series and nobody, nobody mentioned that Farseer was on that list, but it, it, part for me, I think the big reason I would never consider it is because I had a lot of problems with Assassin's Quest. Now, having finished the series, as I look back on Assassin's do. Quest, I think that I'll enjoy it about 10 times more than I did mm-hmm. uh, based on what I read at the end of this series. You will. Is that how you <laughs> felt about this experience as well? I enjoyed Assassin's Quest. I actually use it quite often with readers going through for the first time to sort of get a feel for how they're going to move in the future. If somebody goes to Assassin's Quest and is really struggling, they're going to have moments ahead where they continue to go because you spend a lot of time alone with Fitz in the book. And it can drag. It can seem like it's going nowhere. Mm-hmm. Whereas there are readers like me in the chat didn't even notice that it was slow. We were fine. We were like, no, this is glorious spending all this, these hundreds of pages with the, these characters. So being able to say to people, please just keep going. This has so much value. Keep reading, even with coming back to this book and rereading it. What you got in that book was more than you realized and will add as you you'll be able to go that was why that was in that book 
and it is the one that imp most improved on reread. For sure. Absolutely. Uh, just to address a couple things in the chat here, uh, mm -hmm. Shelly was getting nervous because she's starting Farseal, and we were talking how most of us like live ship more. Rest assured, Farseer is amazing. You get, you get the introduction to one of the greatest literary characters ever. Yeah. And I think most people that read this would probably put them on their top 10 list or their number one yeah. favorite character <laughs> like I like I do. Um, there's, there's another one in here. Yeah. Let me put this back up here because I just yeah. want to address this one because I feel this one keenly. Uh, Fantasy Fanatic put, Realm of the Under Elderlings has the potential to de dethrone Wheel of Time. And you can tell by the pick that Fantasy Fanatic's a big Wheel of Time fan. I'll tell you, there, there are two true statements of me as a reader that have been true for about 30 years. And the two statements are that Stephen King is my favorite author and Lord of the Rings is my favorite book series. And for the first time in my life, I'm questioning both of those statements. Big. Because Robin Hobb and Realm of the Elderlings are both certainly in both of those discussions for me now. So whether you've started this journey or you're about to start this journey, I don't say that lightly. Um, I thought my entire life Stephen King would always be my favorite author. But right now I'm wondering. I mean, Hobb is simply that good. And Realm of the Elderlings as a whole is just something that just really spoke to me as a reader that I really connected with. And I've read Tolkien four times, so I probably need to read Realm of the Elderlings again before I definitively give it the number <laughs> one spot, but it's it's yeah. right up there. Um, now, I know there's a little bit of recency bias, so it's nine days, but ask me in a couple months, maybe I'll have a definitive answer there, but, but it's certainly, for me, that special of a book series. Yeah. Oh, it is. I'll set up and, and not having Farseer in the top trees isn't because it's bad. It just means that right. the later trilogies are that much better. That's you know, right. it's, mm -hmm. It really comes down to that. Yeah, when I, when I say that it's not my favorite, what I mean by that is I gave two of the books a five out of five and one of them a four. Um, <laughs> and that's uh, most certainly not a bad thing. No. no. Yeah, and I would say if Assassin's Fate is my favorite Realm of the Elderlings book, number two is probably Royal Assassin. Still, yeah. Yeah, I, and I honestly think Royal Assassin, like, I think it's still one of the best endings I've ever read. Like, it would definitely be in a top ten books of all time for me. Royal Assassin's great. It's like tenth favorite of me in the series, but that's not because I don't <laughs> So, just because I love so many of the other books that's more. Right. But... <clears throat> the, the Royal Assassin reread was just ridiculously good. I yeah. just completed that like a week ago. I was like, man, this is even better than I remembered. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hard to believe. So crazy. Well, that's the thing when you have great authors, when you're comparing them to great authors, like I did a video of uh, where I ranked all my Joe Abercrombie books and yeah. I had to do a disclaimer, like 10 of these 13 books are five star books. <laughs> I love this author. These are great, yeah. but you know, don't get mad when my favorite is your favorite is 10. <laughs> it just means that it's 10th for me, but it's still amazing. And that's how I feel with Hob. Same thing. Um, yeah, a bad Hob book is a four out of five. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And on the note of bad, bad Hob books is when we, we all have sort of gone, hmm, Rainwilds, the first two Rainwild books were written as one book, but they right. were given to the publisher literally in the moment between Hunger Games being um, published as a book and Hunger Games, the movie. It was right at the beginning of that explosion for YA. And I think the publishers were trying to catch cash in on that. Um, the protagonists in those first two books are a lot younger. Mm -hmm. so perhaps they may sort of squeeze that into the market, but the book needed to be shorter. So they separated those. And I think both books are by the time we get to books three and four of Rain Wilds, we're up and running. And any, you know, loss in quality, and by that we know four star read instead of a five, we've, we've, we're, no, we're back to five star reads again. So, yes, yeah. Rain, Rain Wilds gets a bit of bad press, but it's not actually bad. City and Blood both do as a lot of real cool As things. other That's... hob works. <laughs> yeah. I would say oh, if Rain Wilds didn't exist... If Rainwilds didn't exist, uh, Realm of the Elderlings would be my clear number two series of all time, but it does. So for me, it, it did 
it did have to factor in there for me but i do think there is a lot of good stuff in from uh rain wilds though yeah i mean i'm not to be a downer but you know i mm. i i did like the third and fourth books for rain wilds yeah. but you know personally i thought that second book while you have to read it um I, I absolutely hated it. <laughs> um, uh, basically, everything about it, it, it just did not click for me um, at all. <laughs> you know, like it, it felt like a different writer wrote it. Um, and, you know, I, when I said that, people said, you know, should I read it? And I, I, I think you, you have to. Um, yes. And you can't just get, a, a, get away with reading a synopsis either. Um, no. because of how important that character development is for some of these main characters. Oh, yeah. Uh, but my experience with it was very painful. I, I wish she would have leaned harder into more. Uh, I wish it would have felt like a sequel series to Live Ship. I think that that's what I wanted out of it. And that's not really what it was, obviously. But there mm -hmm. again, there are things I really, really like out of that sub series. So. Yeah, I love the world building aspects of it. That's what I love most about it, because going into that, I still didn't know exactly what an Elberling was. Yep. So, yeah, reread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. It's, yeah, it's definitely important. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to keep this discussion about an hour so that people that aren't here live can maybe see it and think, oh, it's not too long to click on because our whole goal here is to spread the gospel <laughs> of Queen Hob and to get people to read this series. So what I'd like to close with, I'm just going to have uh, each of our panelists just say, who do you think, what kind of reader will love or appreciate realm of the elderlings who would you recommend this series to so uh we'll just go around uh i want to dairy let's start with you um i think if your ideal weekend is to sort of curl a blanket and a cup of tea and you just want to hang out with somebody in a fantasy world this is the one to do it in because you'll be immersed from the first page and you're off on a hell of a ride so that's who I think. Awesome. Matt? Not to be so broad, but I, I really would, I, I recommend this book to everybody um, and not just fantasy fans. I, I've recommended the series to mm -hmm. a family member of mine who has never read a single fantasy book ever and, and likely will not again, that loved this series um, mm -hmm. because it's not a traditional fantasy series. And I, I think even fans of the, kind of Brandon Sanderson type of fantasy. And I don't, I'm not demeaning. I love Brandon Sanderson, but that big explosive, um, you know, kind of almost oriented towards an almost slightly younger audience will also, I think, be endeared to this series. Um, even longtime fantasy readers that aren't used to this slower pace, um, I think will appreciate it for how different it is. Um, so really, uh, I, I can't think of a reader that, I would say, no, avoid that. You're not going to like it. Well said. Scott? Um, I think people that connect emotionally uh, with the character are really going to dig it. Um, I famously have a cold black heart and never cry or anything uh, with stories. And there were multiple times uh, <laughs> that I almost teared up uh, reading these books. <clears throat> so if it can get to me, uh, I can only imagine people that are very emotionally inclined are going to have a great time with this series. Yeah, I, I, I wept a lot. Fool's Fate and Assassin's Fate, especially. <laughs> I, I get it. So many I tissues. almost did as well. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jimmy, how about you? Well, I would say anybody who is a, you know, if you consider yourself a character reader, I think you have to do this uh, for yourself. And I think if you're interested in how far someone can push perspective writing and how much they can flex that, I think this is also a really fabulous series. Uh, I too have recommended this to people who are not big fantasy readers and have come away uh, with something from it. Mm -hmm. And I think that it has a lot of good themes of identity, of loyalty to a detriment. Uh, this series really spoke to me in a level about guilt and how you can't take back words that you say. Yeah. And uh, you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. And what do you do once that has happened? Whether you're the one who said it or someone else is. And this isn't um, 
flaming swords clashing on a mountaintop with the dragon circling over top of it, but it's still monumental on a, on a very personal level. And for me, those are the things that I came out of the series with. And it made me really think about even generational um, trauma and, and, and how that plays in. And I think that the magic system of uh, the skill and the wit is all so beautifully coupled in this. And there's no wasted uh, facets to this thing. It, all, the, all the pieces of this machine work very well together and they're very intentional and they enhance one another. Um, even the perspective choice and then what the magic system is gets to bend the rules a little bit. So I just think Robin Hobbs is super imaginative, but also extremely uh, talented whenever it comes to connecting people on a personal level. So I would love to see more people try this and uh, live life in someone else's shoes for a little bit. Sure. Well, I think that's a perfect way to end this Beautiful broadcast scene. today. Yeah, so well said. Uh, I just want to thank all of you that were here in the chat, or if you're watching this later, drop me a comment. If you don't already subscribe to these four wonderful booktubers channels, please go do so. Thank you for watching this evening, and I hope that you read Rome of the Elderlings and love it as much as the rest of us do. Have a good night.